Ah, it's good to be back. It's been a while. I have been kept busy with my two kids and some projects I'm working on. But I wanted to talk a little bit today about something that Brent and I are working on, which is we have been, once this GPT came out, I all of a sudden um, had the ability to program some stuff because I've always been interested in programming, but I didn't have any knowledge on it. But with GPT-4, it's been easy for me to quickly put stuff together in Python and do things that I never really thought was very feasible for me to do before. So that's been awesome. I got a lot done. I was able to buy a lot of historical data and test things and went down a lot of rabbit holes with, with doing that, which has been pretty fun to pick up that skill set quickly now. And But the, the point I wanted to bring up today was that when you're trading, when you're, at, I'm walking right now, so if you hear me huffing and puffing, that's why. But on a discretionary trading game plan, like a lot of us are doing, there's busy periods and there's slow periods. And when it's busier, I generally, it's weird because when it's busy, I want to eventually trade bigger because I feel like I do better. But the losses are a lot larger because the volatility is increasing. So I actually trade smaller to start my day. And then I'll pile into some certain trades or ideas when I feel like people are stuck or I have momentum and that flow is happening and I'll start to get bigger. So it's, it's strange when it's larger or sorry, when it's busier, I will actually be smaller, but also be larger at the same time, if that makes sense. So, but when you're trying to scale that, it doesn't necessarily work so well because when the market slows down, let's say you try to trade bigger because you were doing well, or you boosted your account. Well, now the conditions are different and it's a shittier trade and you're giving back money trading larger. It doesn't make any sense. You should actually be trading less or trading smaller, waiting for it to be busy again. And it's just the mood of the market is so different. So as a discretionary trader, there's things that work and then you're completely, you're completely changing that and, and moving to new things based on how the market's acting. And then if, when you go through years and years of it, like I have decades of it, certain things come in and out of style. And sometimes they're years apart, different ways of trading, breakouts, mean reversions, um, fed or panic market, like the pandemic or 2008 or uh, events and, and numbers matter, which we just had a lot of, it's still important, but a little less important than it was the last few months with all the inflation data. So you keep recycling those things when they come into play. But my point here today is, so looking at one thing I learned is when I'm looking at system trading. So our Brent and I had some ideas, so we tested them. And one of our ideas that we landed on that worked out the best was slightly positive over time. Maybe like 52 to 55 percent of the trades were winners. So slightly positive. So that's not good enough because even though it actually over a thousand trades during the year. That's how many it had, I think, in 2000, in 2022, which was a lot because it was busier. It did okay, uh, that ratio, but the drawdowns kind of suck because the nasty periods are maybe 50, 60% of your profit comes back, which is just, for me, if you want to trade bigger, that's just, that's tough to swallow. It happens from time to time, but to have that happen regularly, which was the case, it's very difficult to stomach. So we thought, how can we fix that? So we started to look at times during the day. We're like, does this trade work better in the morning? Or uh, does it not work when there's a Fed day? Or how about when we have AM numbers, pre-market numbers, nine o'clock ISM numbers, Federal Reserve minutes. So we started testing around the numbers, pulling out the numbers. We did all these different things. And then we thought, okay, well, we found that when we pulled out certain days, certain volatility periods, we can boost that ratio a little bit. So we got it up to like, I don't know, 55, 58%, which is fairly significant over a thousand trades. So still though, the drawdowns are unacceptably high for us to just run this like a robot in the system. Now keep in mind, we're doing this around our, we're still doing our discretionary trading. This is just like a, a discretionary idea that we liked that we tried to systemize. Um, so, okay, so then from there, we have this thing that's a little bit better now when we're using these time, time periods, filtering that, skipping certain days, like we skip the Fed because it's so crazy. It keeps tripping, stops in and out, that that was not good for us. So what we ended up figuring out and what we're doing now is that the whole thing is just an exercise to scale larger, meaning that when you're a discretionary trader, it can sometimes be hard to get a lot bigger because you got to get big and then you got to get small and you got to get big and you got to get small and there's periods to get big, but they don't happen all the time. So you're always like walking up and down. However, with something like what we're doing with this discretionary mixed with the system is what if for us, 
the system produces trades at an accuracy of 55 or 58 percent and we have all the historical data we went back to like 1999 looked at all kinds of data and we did tons of hours of work on it and we couldn't really get it a lot better so what we decided to do is to use the framework as a way to scale by saying okay when the system fires we're gonna we're gonna talk put our heads together use our 20 years of experience and all the day all the things that are different about that particular day and the themes that are driving the market, and we're going to decide if we do the trade or not. And we're going to decide to skip the trade. So then we kind of um, write down the reasons we skipped, write down the reasons why we did it, and then we analyze how our decision-making is going over time. But a lot of the trades we won't take. But if we can take enough of the trades to have maybe two-thirds of them win versus the 55 58% or whatever, over time, the drawdown is very low compared to what it was which means that you can trade much larger. So you start end up doing this thing where you're actually pulling from your old skill set, but you're doing it in a over like a cookie cutter. If you, if you you know think about raw cookie dough and you're just cutting pieces out. So now you're cutting these pieces out and you can start cutting bigger and bigger pieces, trading larger because you have a defined target, defined profit and defined loss for every trade. So that's the system part of it. Whereas discretionary stuff, you have that, but sometimes it changes. And there's so many different variables that it can become hard to determine, you know, exactly where to do that. But with this, it's always the same. It's always the same uh, win and loss. So it's just a matter of can you get good enough at taking something that slightly works and making it a lot stronger by by analyzing each trade. And that's that's the direction we're going. And it's kind of funny because it's so simple and because it's like, well, big deal. You know, what you describe is not that insightful. But the thing that hit us in the face was like, wow, this is a way that we could trade bigger and we could scale up because we have rules, like specific rules that don't change. And it's a, the type of trade that we're doing is something that I would consider it more longer term day trading. If, if, you know, some trades can last for minutes and some can last for an hour, but that allows you to keep going bigger and bigger and not really worried about getting flipped out all the time or things like that, which we were not interested in. We also weren't interested in holding overnight for this particular thing. So that's kind of what's happening right now. That's one of the ways that we're trying to evolve <clears throat> around just the regular trading that's always happened. And kind of a side conversation for me is like, I, I've been working a lot on stocks the last few years and I've talked a lot about it and I, I still am interested in that, but I put that a little bit on the shelf right now because this has just pulled my attention since the programming stuff has popped up online. I'm able to test a lot of these things. So I'm kind of working with, with the futures, future stuff more right now until I kind of get that ironed out and see how this is going to play out for us. But we need many months to kind of keep testing and working on it. So that's kind of where I've been at lately. And I'm going to keep going down that road. And if it works out well, I'll look at doing it in other markets. But right now I'm sticking to the S&P 500 because I just have such a deeper understanding of things that move that market because that's what I've always traded. So it's just an evolution. And I remember going through, Brent came from the floor um, and then he went to the computer screen stuff. And then that computer screen stuff went through all kinds of changes. I mean, when I started back in 2001, 2002, you could read the order flow and see people buying and selling and so you'd study tapes of your screen, rewatch the moves, and now it's it just doesn't work like that anymore. Everything's hidden in icebergs and machines, and it's just it, the moves are abrupt and people are stuck squeezing, and there's zero day expiry options, and the, the dynamics keep changing. So you have to keep changing. So this is an effort by us to adapt a little bit um, to the conditions, but also use some of the stuff that doesn't go away, which is strategic thinking, general themes for the day. Like, are we driven by tech sell-off or like today, I think Drunken Miller came out in the morning and talked about AI and it pumped us back up and we made a failed high and then we kind of blew off down all day. So it's just like, after that happens, usually the pressure just stays on the downside. It's something we've seen in the past. So we were talking about how do we get in short and use that to our, to our advantage with what we're doing. And it's just constantly th- analyzing things like that pulling up old patterns of thinking that still work, but they're just not the same as they used to be. They work in a different way. And I think even with all this AI stuff, <clears throat> there it's going to be hard for, for th- those things to not work anymore. Just general 
supply and demand, the way people think, different um, uh, different market moves that that it's still going to do the same thing from A to B. It just does it in a different fashion. It moves in a different way. And I'm not sure that that's ever going to change. Uh, the logic of how it goes from A to B will likely never change. But the the way that it does it will change because it has been changing. And I think that's the challenge is to figure out <clears throat> how do you move yourself when the moves that you used to see, maybe you don't see the same way anymore. And I'm not sure in the stock market if that's, I don't know enough about short-term stock trade to know if that's the same or not, but in the futures, it certainly has moved around and changed a lot. But then you also get periods where it goes back to the way it used to be when it's very busy and then it um, quickly will slow down and we'll move back to kind of more of a normal market where, you know, it'll be harder to read when you're trying to stare at an order book, which, you know, I'm sure there's someone who is staring at an order book and finding it useful, but I certainly don't find it that useful anymore. I used to, so for whatever that's worth. But that's what I've been doing, and it's been exciting. So I, I, I'm kind of blown away by the <clears throat> all the AI stuff because I got in there right away. I love getting on and trying new things and quickly realized that I was like, oh, I'm going to watch these videos on YouTube and learn Python. And then quickly I was like, this is a waste of my time. I can just go in there, hack around, make mistakes, copy things that are similar to what I want to do, and just start finding error codes, pasting them in, getting fixes for them, <clears throat> talking intelligently, prompting intelligently, figuring out um, kind of in a backwards way how to get done what I wanted to. And I got done stuff that I never thought I could do in, in a million years, honestly. And I learned a ton in the process about how to do things. So it really opened my mind up to, you can really do almost anything now with technology that you want to get done with this stuff, which is really cool. I'm sure there are limits, but you can find those limits and then get people to help you, which wasn't really available uh, a while back. So just many months back even. So that's, it's been pretty cool. I think that interesting to see how that changes the market. I don't think it will change it that much because the stuff's been out there for a while in financial markets, but for each one of us, it's like, there's no limit to creative expression we can have with computers now, which is pretty cool. You just have to be willing to get in there and break the learning curve and try some stuff. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And I have some other ideas and things I want to talk about, but I'll save that for another one. I'm adding a little segment here after the fact to the end of that last podcast because I want to hammer home the point that I was making. I felt like I might not have been clear enough. So the point is that if you're a discretionary trader and you're doing swing trading and you're thinking, oh, well, I'm risking one to make three. The reality is a lot of times you get messed up in the head and that's not really the case. You think you're doing that and you just keep losing one every time. You think you're being methodical, but a lot of times it's very, it's just, it's an art project. You know, it's very just touch and feel it's intuitive what what i'm describing is you've tested something that works a certain amount of time and now you're adding a discretionary flair to how you're going to do that so the profit and loss is always the same every time but you're now just deciding when you're going to take those trades or if it's an actual system you're taking every single trade but in my case i found that it's better to use my experience to siphon off trades that I just know are probably not going to be good. And then I'm going to see how good am I at doing that. And I test myself versus just the basic, uh, the robot system. So after I have an initial idea of something, so the initial idea actually doesn't matter that much. It matters a little bit, but if I can just get something that's not terrible. So imagine this, imagine if I just have something that works 50% of the time, right? It's 50, 50. And I just, but in that 50-50, in that I have rules. I have guaranteed loss and guaranteed profit. Let's just say three points and three points, just for an example, whatever. And then <clears throat> now if I can figure out how to cut out certain days or double up once in a while on things that I really like or whatever it is, maybe I don't change my size at all until I have, you know, I take move maybe all the trades are the same size, whatever you want to do. But my point is I get really good at deciding um, when that system might not work and then I, I, I can cut out just a few losers. All of a sudden now it's a 63% chance of winning and the drawdowns go way down. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm continually able to trade larger as I prove that works. Whereas when I'm discretionary trading, it's just, it's not quite that simple. It's a lot more artsy. And that's the difference between having something that's a little more systematic, but I'm still using a discretionary uh, filter on it. After, after trying it the other way, that's, I felt like I was not using a lot of my knowledge 
by just taking trades that the system told me to take that were not things that I would ever do normally. So that's kind of how I got to this. And Brent and I are working this together. So hopefully that maybe I made that point well before, but that was kind of the benefit. That's the whole benefit I got out of this is the ability to scale. 